Hi there, welcome to the webinar today. We're going to just give everybody a couple more seconds to get logged in and we will get rolling here, but we are uh, looking forward to this uh, webinar with, uh, with Dr. Zasler. And so as we, as we wait for the last, uh, the last couple folks to come in, just wanted to reiterate the idea behind this webinar. So, you know, Kyle Kinberger is our national sales manager here at HMR Funding. And uh, while he and his sales team travel around the country every week, you know, they hear from countless attorneys uh, who are taking in uh, head injury cases every month, but seem unsure of how best to proceed. And they're looking for direction when it comes to the appropriate steps in working a case like that up. Uh, so, you know, there's definitely a heightened uh, sense of awareness among attorneys about TBIs because of the NFL concussion cases. Um, and so each year, uh, you know, more and more information comes out about concussions and head trauma, and that's leading to attorneys making TBI cases a, a larger part of their personal injury cases. Uh, so we here at HMR Funding believe uh, many attorneys are now looking uh, at TBI cases as a driver of their practice, but lack that roadmap uh, about how people suffering from a head injury should be treated uh, and who they should be treating with. Uh, so, you know, as you're probably aware, you know, uh, you know, most attorneys, you know, know two things about TBI cases. So they're complex and they're expensive. Um, so we solve one of those critical issues and we can help with the, the costs incurred. Uh, but this webinar uh, with Dr. Zasler, uh, you know, we hope we'll shed some light on that second uh, issue of the complexity and be beneficial as he answers some of those questions uh, pertinent to uh, uh, neuro rehabilitation. Uh, and so we want to extend a, just a sincere thanks to Dr. Zazer for taking time uh, to be on this webinar with us and to just take us all through the, uh, uh, through the world of uh, post-acute neuro rehabilitation. Um, I think we've got a pretty good number right now. I'm sure we'll get uh, some more coming in, but uh, I'm going to turn this over to, to Dr. Zasler to uh, tell us just a little bit about uh, himself and, uh, and get rolling with the webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start by just giving you a little background and that is my training is as a physiatrist or specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation. I also did fellowship training in brain injury and am subspecialty certified in brain injury medicine. The latter is a relatively new subspecialization for neurology, physiatry, and psychiatry. I've been practicing for about 30 plus years. I've been doing post-acute care of one sort or another for close to that period of time and have um, written, published, spoken extensively on topics relating to TBI, both from an assessment and management standpoint across the spectrum from concussion to very severe brain injury and what's termed disorders of consciousness like vegetative state or minimally conscious state and been involved with guideline development for both ends of the spectrum. I have owned and run a program called Tree of Life for just over 20 years. That's the picture you see on the first slide and was doing transitional rehab in a different facility prior to opening after that one closed the Tree of Life program because I felt there was a gap in the continuum of service for both transitional and certainly also long-term placement that provided specialized care in the context of acquired brain injury and neuro rehabilitation. With that little intro behind us, I'd like to move on. The goals of the talk today are several. One is to discuss changes impacting the nature of TBI care in this country review post-acute rehab terminology, which can obviously get confusing, learn the typical path from acute care to post-acute rehabilitation care, 
examine the continuum of post-acute rehab services, emphasizing transitional and long-term care programming, delineate PAR programmatic aspects in need of consideration by referring parties, whether it's you as the attorney, the family, a work comp carrier, an insurance company, these are all relevant to all those potential referring parties, <clears throat> and identify the evidence-based literature reporting on the efficacy of post-acute rehabilitation for persons with TBI. If we can get through all that in the 50 minutes or so that I have, I will have done well. Let's start with looking at changes impacting the nature of TBI care in this country, understanding that how our system is arranged is very different from a lot of other countries. We have some pluses, we also have some minuses. Science, to start with, has not been driving the majority of payer decisions regarding length of stay and acute rehabilitation following brain injury. Unfortunately, economics has been the primary driving factor for payer approval of care and lengths of stay, as I'm sure you've all dealt with. Societally, we in the U.S. seem committed to saving people's lives, but have not come to terms with how to continue to support patients after TBI and other forms of acquired brain injury in their ongoing recovery and community reentry, which at times, if it's more moderate to severe in nature, the brain injury can cause protracted need for services and often recovery is a multi-year process. There is also a propensity on the part of certain payers to limit or deny accessibility, particularly to longer term or more specialized and therefore typically expensive services. There are certain states that have Medicaid waivers to facilitate post-acute care for this patient population, but these are limited and not all states have them, my own included in Virginia. Cost of care has been shown to be highest, and this should be an interesting number for you all, for long-term care followed by acute hospitalization costs, paramedical and medical costs in that order after TBI. So some of the terminology you'll hear as germane to the topic of post-acute rehabilitation is outpatient rehabilitation, day rehabilitation, transitional rehabilitation, supported and assisted living, which can include semi-independent living, LTACs or long-term acute care, and then obviously nursing homes, um, which may include subacute care. Subacute care can also be done in other settings other than nursing homes, including in acute care hospitals and in um, non-nursing home settings if they're appropriately licensed and state licensure allows them to do that. Outpatient rehab typically focuses on select therapies um, for a few hours a week. Day rehab is typically a more intensive program where you have the patient coming regularly and staying for multiple hours per day, receiving an array of services, typically including nursing services and therapeutic interventions through OTPT and or speech. I'll talk more about transitional and supported living. Long-term acute care is typically applicable to patients who have higher medical acuity issues, ventilator dependency, um, significant wounds that require more intensive hospital-like environments. My own opinion is, and this is opinion, and I'll try to distinguish fa fact and evidence um, from the literature with my own experience, nursing home placements are, in my experience over 30 plus years, not ideal for these patients and typically their morbidity, mortality, quality of life all um, suffer with the typical nursing home placement. Subacute care is typically a level of care where patients are 
very low level or early in their recovery and not able to meet typical Medicare criteria of three hours of therapy per day. And they remain there until they either are transferred to a nursing home. If they don't improve, that's what typically happens. Or if they do improve, then they may go to rehab. <clears throat> typical paths from acute care to post-acute rehabilitation are as follows. The patient is discharged from the ER to community. That typically happens with milder injuries like concussions. Um, patient is discharged from acute trauma or neurosurgical care to community. Or lastly, patient is discharged from acute inpatient rehabilitation to community. Typically, no specialized follow-up is recommended. Patients with mild TBI or concussions often are lost to follow-up and end up seeking primary care for specialized problems or seek help from physicians who are not trained in brain injury medicine. Many patients, and this has gotten worse over time because of the compression of acute rehab length of stays, Many patients are sent home still in what's termed post-traumatic amnesia, meaning they're not consolidating memories over time, which produces a scenario that those of us in the field feel uh, lends itself to a liability risk all around and is not safe for the patient or the family. Many patients who should continue to receive rehab services are either not referred or do not have access to appropriate services in their geographic locale. What should happen after post-acute care? Well, a lot will depend upon the medical complexity, functional outcome, and level of community support available to the patient. Discharge disposition options can include institutional care, nursing home, group home, specialized long-term care as examples, the community with support or independent community living. Ongoing outpatient or day rehab services may be appropriate and medically indicated following transitional rehabilitation program discharge. Brain injury medicine physician and or rehab therapy follow-up may still be indicated, sometimes lifelong, particularly with more significant injuries in the moderate to severe um, category. Who gets referred for post-acute rehab after TBI? This is an interesting, albeit a little older, study from 2003 by Mellick and colleagues, and it was published in a journal that I am chief editor of called Brain Injury, which is the major journal in the field. Understanding outcomes based on post-acute hospitalization pathways followed by persons with TBI, and they did a telephone survey, which was statewide population-based, found that almost two-thirds of individuals received no additional services following discharge from acute care. And clearly that is bad medicine, but that's what's happening and that continues to happen. Persons who went to long-term care were typically older, had a government payer, meaning Medicaid or Medicare, or TRICARE and had the poorest outcomes. When you look at the continuum of PAR services, the continuum that's available varies greatly from one community to another. Many communities lack PAR programs in toto, meaning they don't have outpatient, day rehab, transitional long-term care. Transitional ABI programs are few and far between as are specialized long-term care ABI programs. Outpatient and day rehab is generally more available, but you have to be in at least typically medium-sized to bigger cities to access those kinds of services. And again, accessing them is often dependent upon whether your fifth vital sign, that is your insurance, covers it or if you even have insurance. There are some places where people are fortunate enough to get um, accepted for indigent care even if they don't have a payer source. 
Transitional neurorehabilitation is generally considered a stepping stone type of rehab. It may be acute, subacute, or postacute, depending on the setting. Goals remain return to community. So when someone is admitted to this kind of program, the team, the referral agency or person, everybody's on the page of, we're gonna try to get him back into community. The patient may also be slow to progress or a patient who's regressed, which can also happen particularly after moderate to severe brain injury. But once in a while, even after concussion, you can see somebody get seemingly better and then get worse. We don't always know how to predict outcomes. Obviously, that science of prediction is still not perfected, unfortunately. Sometimes for a variety of reasons, a TR referral may turn into a long-term placement. Hopefully that doesn't happen too often. TR may also be indicated when there is a recovery complication, such as communicating hydrocephalus, severe behavioral issues, intractable multi-symptom impairments, like might be seen in concussion. TR admission times may be relatively short, meaning a few weeks, or potentially quite long with progressive decreases in environmental restrictions as the patient's functional status improves. <clears throat> Long-term supported living is presumed to be a permanent placement when the patient comes into the program, whether that's a community-based program or an institutional setting. The patient may require more or less care over time, depending on recovery. The science tells us that about a third of patients after severe TBI decline functionally over time. We don't fully understand why that happens. We can talk once I'm done if people have further questions on that about some of the at least hypothesized reasons. Individuals may require 24-7 care or some level of less intensive support, which may occur across a continuum of supervision levels and settings. Some clients may require one-to-one -one care. However, this is not typical of the average patient receiving such services. Where you may see it more frequently is in patients who have severe neuropsychiatric or neurobehavioral problems and are in specialized neuropsychiatric type units. Typically, those are locked units. Programs may vary substantially as far as location, number of beds, staffing, level of expertise in TBI assessment and treatment, among other variables. As with any program, there should be ongoing oversight of care being rendered relative to the services being provided, patient progress, treatment goals, and charges. If the client can reintegrate into the community, then attempts should be made to support that reentry. There should be various levels of residential care and community independence available in these types of programs. <clears throat> if the client improves enough, then return to community can be considered, assuming it is deemed safe, which again, safe is a relative term, and rehab comes with risks. So it's a issue of relative weighting of risk, which sometimes is challenging with this patient population. What is supervised living? It's a living scenario where the person with TBI has some level of external support services provided. For example, we have apartments for more independent individuals, but we might provide transportation or assist with shopping and financial management, things like that. Support services may include direct assistance periodically with activities of daily living or mobility, assistance with higher level activities such as budgeting, banking, shopping, or medication management. Licensing and certifications. It is critical when you're looking at these kind of programs to examine how the facility or program is licensed. There is no consistency across states as far as through what agency licensing occurs. Understand what additional credentials or certifications the program and or its staff may have 
that may be relevant to your client or case. For example, if a program doesn't regularly treat complex post-concussion cases, that's not the kind of program you want to be referring your patient who's got 10 different symptom complaints after a concussion and isn't getting better a year later. Understand the challenges and limitations associated with meeting licensing standards and or pursuing facility certification. Um, this is not an easy hoe to row, which is probably in part an explanation for why you don't see too many programs doing transitional and long-term specialized care. There are certainly other reasons. Lastly, requirements for CARF accreditation will vary with payer. What I mean by that, just to be clear, is that some payers don't care. Other payers insist that if you're not CARF certified, they're not going to consider referring patients to you. What types of healthcare services should be available? From my perspective, pretty much the same services that you would need as a healthy individual plus some ones that you probably wouldn't need like neuropsychiatry, neuropsychology, um, specialized ENT services, specialized ophthalmological and optometric services. You can look at the list. I'm not going to bore you by reading the whole thing. I think one of the important ones here is that ideally the doc in charge of the program should be someone who is certified in brain injury medicine, whether neurologist, psychiatrist, or physiatrist. And ideally, because we who are certified or sub subspecialty certified in brain injury medicine aren't necessarily primary care physicians, having a consulting internist or family practitioner to the program for medical follow along is also important. <clears throat> so professional staffing issues, the big points I want to make, use of own staff versus contracted staff. Ideally, the more consistency you have in staffing and the more control you have over your staffing, which typically occurs when the person's an employee and not a subcontracted staff person, the better in my experience depth of staffing and type of staff relative to training and expertise needs to be looked at when making decisions about referrals. The staff-client ratios, do staff work independently or as a transdisciplinary cohesive team, which I think the latter is clearly preferred in our experience. Primary care staff versus therapy and administrative staff also need to be considered. One of the things I would caution when people ask about what's your staff to client ratio, if staff include things like administrators, et cetera, it's going to increase that staff to client ratio. What I think you're more interested in is the direct care staff to client ratio, just to make that important point. Professional staffing issues, what therapies are on site on a daily versus regular versus when necessary basis, what ancillary services beyond the traditional PTOT and speech therapy and therapeutic recreation are provided, what are the ancillary services that are available, whether a cognitive behavioral therapist, a music therapist, um, et cetera. Variability in programs are substantive. A study by Mel Glenn and colleagues published in Journal of Head Trauma Rehabilitation in 2005 found tremendous variability in staffing with staff to client ratio range from 0.77 to 3.3. Again, my concern with that study is who did they include in staff? Lengths of stay range from 0.13 to 288 months. I think that's a typo. It should be, well, it might be right. 0.13 to 288 months. Time from injury to admission varied from 0.2 to 180 months. So some people got in obviously very quickly. Should 24 hour staffing be available on site and off for your client to get the best care? 
in my opinion, there should be 24 seven staff coverage, 365 days per year. There should also be year round access to a clinical program director or medical director or a covering physician, nurse practitioner or physician's assistant. Um, ideally, other personnel such as administrative program director access would be important and someone involved with behavioral management like a neuropsychologist or behavioral psychologist. <laughs> what about lengths of stay? There are no current standards for either um, transitional day rehab, outpatient rehab. Length of stay will vary depending on treatment goals, initial severity of injury, the impairments present at the time that they enter the program, their functional status, their age, discharge disposition, and safety assurances. After moderate to severe TBI, and these are more experiential than data-driven in the sense of published evidence-based studies, with moderate to severe TBI, at least three months, but more likely six to 12 months is reasonable if the patient is transferred early post-injury. Complex multi-symptom post-concussion patients can take three to six months or longer, depending upon what the specific issues are. For more challenging cases, such as those involving dual diagnoses, which I'll talk about momentarily, time frames may be longer. We're big on family involvement and most programs who do this follow suit. It's important on a number of levels. Programs should encourage family visits, whether on-site or eventually to the client's home if the client is functioning at a level that allows that. Family involvement generally helps maintain hope and motivation from not only the client, but also the family members and significant others. It can also assist in provision of corroboratory information regarding pre-injury status, as well as feedback when patient is in community on pass in terms of what might be done to improve the patient's functional abilities to a greater extent. Private rooms generally are preferred and facilitate personal choice. It also provides for privacy and as appropriate sexual expression or activity. Generally felt to better facilitate behavioral control and typically associated with higher cost to the payer as opposed to putting two or three people in a room, which happens in some programs. Home visits, when it is anticipated that an individual will return home, then home visits should definitely be a goal. They may also be appropriate in select long-term residential clients. Home visits allow an opportunity to test the client's readiness for community reentry. Some long-term clients may go home, but their family is not equipped to care for them at home long-term because they work, have other obligations, other kids at home, um, but may want to have the patient home for holidays, birthdays, those kind of things. And they're able to handle the person for the short period of time for that event. Home visits are a litmus test to determine how well skills have generalized to other environments that have been learned during rehabilitation. Duration of home visits should be gradual based on achievement of specific therapeutic goals, particularly for those who are headed towards discharge after transitional care. Home visits should also be considered a therapeutic leave of absence, which often we have to document that carefully with payers. Programmatic costs. This is an interesting one because there is a high variability in program costs. Um, I've given you some ranges there, transitional from 650 to 1500, again, averages. Long-term care, depending on the services being provided, 400 to 1,000 per day with high variability across programs in part related to the standard fee structure. 
and in part related to differences in need for ongoing therapeutic interventions. So in my program, we have some clients who get very little service because they don't need it as far as therapy interventions or medical complexity of care and others who have high medical complexity of care and continue to require services so that they don't regress functionally. Therapy services, again, you see a wide variability in session charges across programs. Programmatic costs, again, neuropsychology, pretty high variability. Counseling, behavioral management needs to be differentiated from clinical neuropsychological testing services. Physician services, specialty physician services, typically not included in the per diem rate. Visits versus procedures, there's a high variability in pricing structure. The cost efficacy of convergent versus divergent medical management models um, is significant. So what I mean by this is if you have a brain injury medicine certified physician who's comfortable dealing with the neurological, neurobehavioral, neurocognitive, physical aspects of injury, you're not going to be sending the person to a psychiatrist and neurologist and accruing significant charges, but also splintering the care and making it divergent, which is typically much more difficult to coordinate. So if you have clinicians who are competent by training and experience to treat these patients more holistically, it's better. And we've already talked about the subspecialization issues. You need to compare apples to apples. Per diem costs will vary, as I said, across programs. What's included in the per diem will also vary. So in a lot of programs, neuropsych services, including counseling services and testing, are separately charged. Physician services are separately charged. On-call availability of key staff, as I mentioned earlier, is also an issue. And then ancillary services may not be subsumed in the per diem rate, which is typically how most of these programs bill. So they don't split out their rates and CPT code each intervention, but rather they do a bundled per diem charge um, for the program and the services. Should clients engage in activities off-site? Off-site activity participation clearly allows for better assessment of how well the client can do in community versus <clears throat> in the absence of more structure. Off-site activity should include real-world activities such as shopping, recreational participation, and socialization. Should the program take other diagnoses? Again, I've always been a believer that if you do one thing well, that's what you should stick to. That doesn't always happen in programs and a number of programs just to fill beds may take a variety of diagnoses. Generally, I would not encourage that. Patients with neurodegenerative disorders, such as Alzheimer's, Pick's disease, etc., have different functional issues, neurological courses, as well as medical and psychological needs compared to individuals with more static encephalopathy, as might be seen after traumatic brain injury, stroke, or hypoxic anoxic brain injury. Persons with neurodegenerative conditions typically are older and socially will not fit in with the typical person with acquired brain injury who's going to tend to be younger. Should there be specialized testing? I think the clear answer is yes. It's essential that practitioners in the program utilize standardized and norm testing protocols that have been validated in persons with acquired brain injury including TBI, a poor understanding of test data interpretation may result in false positive or false negative findings. Tests not validated in acquired brain injury may not be either specific or sensitive enough to detect acquired brain injury related impairment. Should there be specialized equipment? Good neuro rehab as well as musculoskeletal rehab 
does not necessarily require high-tech expensive equipment. You might get a different opinion from someone else on that one, but that's my opinion. Newer technology and techniques, which we do use, may indeed facilitate the neurorehabilitation process, but there remain controversies with many of these devices and interventions. Programs that have specialized neurorehabilitation equipment may be better able to provide cost-efficient care if they have clinicians who know how to use the equipment well. What about those clients with more severe behavioral problems? Behavioral problems clearly occur along a spectrum and may be from mild to extremely severe. Such impairments may be neuropsychiatric or secondary psycho-emotional responses to trauma-related consequences, whether depression, anxiety spectrum disorders, including PTSD as the more common ones. Programs should only admit patients with behavioral impairments that can be managed by the program staff and that they are experienced and competent in managing. With severe issues, locked units are highly preferable. A biopsychosocial approach for these types of problems is critical and results in optimal outcomes. Adequate external resources should also be available in managing these types of patients, including psychiatric, neuropsychiatric, and or psychological consultants if the program doesn't have those people on site and as needed inpatient psychiatric services. So, for example, that would be relevant in a patient who was suicidal or homicidal and needed that kind of structure and oversight. Dual diagnoses. Depending on the dual diagnoses, programs must determine their ability to assess and treat the patient in question. And dual diagnoses are common in this patient population. We need to also appreciate pre-injury psychological and psychiatric issues which are common in this patient population. Good differential diagnosis is crucial to working with these kinds of patients as well as providing an adequate treatment armamentarium. Common dual diagnoses seen in patients like this include substance abuse, neuropsychiatric impairment, catastrophic psychological reactions, functional neurological disorders, what used to be termed conversion disorder, chronic pain issues like headache, which is a particular interest of mine, um, chronic neck pain, and lastly, spinal cord injury. Where should therapies be provided? Ideally, in as many different environments as possible. On-site therapies should obviously be available for more impaired patients who may be less able to access community. Community-based therapy should be a goal for higher functioning clients. Formal treatment sessions should be intermingled with treatment in more naturalistic settings. <clears throat> should patients with disorders of consciousness be accepted into such programs? The answer depends on the scope of expertise of the program and staff as well as licensing regulations. There are programs nationally that will admit vegetative, minimally conscious uh, patients for TR as well as patients with locked-in syndrome, which if you're not familiar with the term we can discuss. A very different knowledge base is required to assess and treat this group of patients in comparison to that required for patients who don't have disorders of consciousness, proximity to a hospital is preferable given the higher level of medical complexity of these patients and their risk for medical destabilization. I wanted to just spend a minute on engagement and enrichment. Keeping patients engaged is key to optimizing neurorehabilitation outcomes. A concept of so-called environmental enrichment, which is basically doing things with the patient at levels and intensities and frequency much greater than those that would occur under other circumstances, such as home care or outpatient periodic therapies, has been shown to drive neuroplasticity and optimize functional outcome 
in all animals, whether brain injured or not, that includes humans. Post-acute rehab provides for a controlled application of environmental enrichment together with structured behavioral paradigms that promote adaptive plasticity and may prophylax or guard against functional decline after moderate to severe TBI, which I talked about earlier. Additionally, exercise and task-specific training also positively impact neuroplastic changes. Some of the research challenges in this patient population include the heterogeneity of the population, that is no two brain injuries are the same, lack of standardized paradigms for assessment and treatment for most conditions for which PAR is provided, substantial differences across treatment settings, inconsistent terminology use, intensity of therapeutic interventions and types of interventions provided. What is important to assess when you're looking at efficacy studies? The primary criteria of any outcome study is to understand whether there was a representative and well-defined sample of patients at a similar point in the course of their disease being examined. You need to examine whether there was sufficient duration for data collection and whether the follow-up data was complete. One of the challenges with working research-wise with persons with TBI is the relatively high dropout rate in studies, which messes up your ability to make sound conclusions. Secondary criteria for evaluating the validity of an outcome study should include whether or not an objective and unbiased outcome criteria was used and whether there was adjustment for important prognostic factors. And get to the evidence. So I'm not gonna go into detail here. I'd, I'd like to just present some of these studies and make you aware that there is a substantive, albeit somewhat mixed literature on post-acute rehabilitation dating back to the early 1980s. George Prigatano and his group looked at a small group. Ben Yashai at NYU in 1987 looked at a larger group Randy Evans, who was with Learning Services, he's unfortunately passed away, did a analysis of 21 studies. He found a TBI diagnosis in 81% of sample with MVA accounting for 60% of mechanism injury, 79% severe, 7% moderate, and 13% mild. Pre-treatment home placement, 32.8 and discharge 81.5%. So there was a substantive improvement in functional status with um, treatment. Competitive employment pre-treatment was very low at 5.6% and at 50% at graduation with maintenance of gains at follow-up. Non-competitive employment 0.4% pre-treatment and somewhat higher at 113 with gains maintained at follow-up post-discharge. Um, James Malik, this was um, a decent study, but it didn't have a control group. The study concluded that an integrated comprehensive post-acute brain injury program was both effective and cost-effective and recommended early intervention for optimal outcomes. Um, Walter High at Tier in Texas did a study in 2006, which was quite a large sample size. It was non-randomized um, intervention with pretest and follow-up design. All groups showed improvement between admission and discharge on measures of overall disability, independence, home integration, and productivity, and maintain the gains, which is just as important, at follow-up. A study by Betger in 2007 found the best evidence for efficacy was for stroke rehabilitation in terms of looking at multidisciplinary rehab services in the post-acute arena. Strong evidence for efficacy in moderate to severe TBI emphasized the need for further research given limitations and the possibility of systematic reviews. 
I will say that the issue of post-concussive treatment in transitional has really not been looked at, so there's really no good data there that I'm aware of. Um, Deb Braunling McMurrow with Learning Services published a study in 2010, decent sample size. They found the model achieved significant functional gains of approximately 1.5 levels for impaired adults with and without associated behavioral and substance abuse problems. Kim and Colantonio published a systematic review. They found 10 studies met inclusion, seven studies found PAR benefited community integration. All effective studies involved occupational therapy. A AHRQ study published in 2012 looked at multidisciplinary post-acute rehab for moderate to severe TBI in adults. They concluded that the currently available evidence was deemed insufficient to draw conclusions about the effectiveness of multidisciplinary post-acute rehab for persons with moderate to severe TBI. So this study flies contrary to all the studies I've reviewed so far. We'll continue. Griesbach and colleagues in 2015 examined PAR effects on outcome and life care costs. They found cost savings and functional effectiveness was more marked when rehabilitation was initiated within the first year after TBI. Significant effects and cost projections relative to rehab savings were found following participation in post-acute rehab for these patients. And then a study by Hook in just published this year assessed the effect of PAR on functional independence, looking at moderate to severe TBI in 271 adults admitted between 2012 and 2017. The majority of patients were discharged home. The sooner patients were admitted, the more likely it was that they would be discharged home as opposed to supported living. Findings supported the notion that providing intensive PAR had a positive impact on functional independence in this patient population. Roe et al. also this year did a randomized controlled trials of PAR, um, looked at those for moderate to severe TBI using a systematic review methodology. There was a lack of uniformity of data and collection methods, heterogeneity of structures and processes of rehab services, as I've discussed, and no use of a common set of outcome measurements also as discussed, making comparisons between studies difficult, and this is the current challenge really from my perspective. This study belabors the point of challenges of RCTs in TBI PAR research, RCT, randomized control trial. So directions for future research include the need for controlled, prospective, randomized, blinded studies, examine the ethical issues with study design between non-treatment versus alternative treatment. We can't ethically withhold treatment, but you can compare a group that didn't receive PAR services from a group similar injury, similar course, who didn't have access to those services as an example. Establish consensus on the terminology we use, the definitions and injury parameter criteria that are to be examined. There's a need for consensus on what predictors of outcome should be examined. There's also a need for consensus on what outcome variables are most important and should be assessed. We need to determine methodologies to assess specific outcome measures and examine and standardize the services in PAR that are being provided and assessed. There's still quite a bit of research necessary in order to do that. Look at traditional versus specialized models of long-term care and compare things like morbidity, mortality, quality of life, functional outcome. In conclusion, 
and I think I'm about right on time. There are a lot of factors to consider when choosing post-acute rehab programs for your clients, particularly when it comes to transitional or long-term care placements. Key points when choosing programs are to know the program's reputation, who the program can serve, staffing, expertise, cost, and licensure. It is strongly encouraged that people considering referral to a program visit the program before making final decisions on placement recommendations. This would include you, a payer, a family, a significant other. Involved parties should meet with key program players and come prepared with a list of questions. Know who the people in charge are and how to reach them. Note the key players as far as national providers and understand programmatic differences. Keep up with relevant literature in this area to best advocate for your client's care and or to know where you can go to obtain this type of information. Um, I was asked to throw this in um, a little plug, but I do some medical legal consultation. I'm generally pretty busy, but the stuff I like to do at this point in my career is case analysis, peer review, which is not for purposes of testimony, workers' compensation, medical legal avals, and assistance with provision of scientific references relative to your case, whether PI or work comp as well as assistance with development of a scientifically based line of questioning for deposition or trial in TBI cases. I'd like to thank HMR Funding, who's the sponsor of today's webinar, in particular, um, Kyle, who's the national sales manager, who has been very helpful. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, my telephone number is there, both the 804 and the toll-free 888 number, or you can reach out to us at info at treeoflife.com. And that's the conclusion, and we'll move to questions and answers. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Zasler. We've got a, a bunch of questions that have come in, so I will... Uh, get started here and uh, and start start throwing some of these questions out. I hope I can answer all of them. Uh, so one was uh, there is interest in knowing more about what locked in syndrome is. So can you expand on that? Sure. Locked in syndrome is a behavioral descriptor for a neurologic state, typically occurring after stroke involving the pons, which is part of your brainstem, uh, specifically the ventral or forward part of the pons, and it leaves the patient unable to talk, or what's termed anarthric, and quadriplegic, meaning unable to move. So if you don't take the time to examine the patient adequately, they might be thought to be vegetative, or in that context, unaware of self or environment, yet Typically, if it's an isolated ventral pontine infarction or stroke, cognition is felt to be preserved. And these patients can communicate through two ways, which include eye blink and eye movements. Hmm. It's interesting. Let's see. Um, we had a couple questions about uh, what tests uh, do you recommend in diagnosing TBI? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, so a lot of that would depend on the severity of the TBI. Most of the tests, I'll sort of take it categorically, most of the tests that are used for concussion don't tend to show abnormality. So the rate of abnormal CT, MRI, EEG in a post-concussive patient is pretty low. Um, the earlier you get those tests done, if you so choose to do them, the higher the likelihood of abnormalities as opposed to moderate to severe TBI where you see a much higher incidence of abnormalities in those three more traditional tests. There are now 
a number of other things that we're looking at, like biomarkers, functional brain imaging, that may yield better ability to make diagnoses, particularly in milder injury, uh, more accurately and more expediently. Um, even looking at tests that look at abnormalities in eye movements as an indicator or hallmark of concussive brain injury. So there's a lot going on in the context of research that hasn't reached daily clinical practice yet. But again, I, I would qualify that any discussion has to be germane to what type of patient we're talking about. And answer generically for all patients the same answer. Very good. And I think there was pro this is probably an add-on to what you just said. And, and forgive me if you did just answer this. Uh, we had another question on your thoughts on advanced brain imaging to objectively verify injury in mild or moderate TBI cases, and basically best kinds of imaging, DTI, and nuclear imaging, et cetera. Is that similar to what you were just talking about? Yeah, um, DTI is diffusion tensor imaging. It's a way of looking at tracks of fibers in the brain. Um, it, there is literature published on this, by the way, both in the neuroimaging literature as well as in some of the medical legal literature um, and a number of position statements have come out over the years about the applicability, appropriateness of the use of these techniques in the courtroom. So probably a longer discussion, maybe an, it's a different lecture um, than we have time for today, but there's a lot of controversy about some of the tests that have been used and purported to prove that there was brain injury, including things like SPECT or single photon emission computerized tomography, PET scans, functional MRI. Um, I don't know if people have heard of morphometric imaging, um, like using FreeSurfer or NeuroQuant software, um, but there's a whole slew of things out there that um, remain, I'll use the word controversial as far as whether they're ready for prime time use in the courtroom. Excellent. Thank you. That was probably a longer answer than you wanted, but I hope it answered the question. I, I think so. I think that was great. Uh, we had another question here. Uh, it was asking for an example of a catastrophic reaction that is not a vegetative state or locked in status and okay. how might just, something like that be? Yeah, just, just to be clear, that's a psychological phraseology and it typically is more in reference to the milder end of the injury spectrum where somebody and certain personalities are going to be more prone to this than others where somebody who was, for example, histrionic or very type A, detail-oriented, obsessive-compulsive, uh -huh. gets a brain injury and basically ends up having a very adverse psychological response to their functional limitations to the point of it becoming catastrophic, in quotes, and basically they end up being, in quotes, copeless and unable to deal with their losses in terms of the impairments that limit their daily activities. Like, I would be a bad person to have a concussion because I'm very type A and obsessive, and I would lose a lot of my edge if I was concussed, and I would not deal well with that. So somebody like that is going to be at increased risk for adverse psychological responses. And we see it, you know, on a regular basis, people who don't get better, they're not referred to appropriate clinicians, they have persistent headaches, persistent dizziness, persistent neck pain, persistent visual problems. Nobody's tested their sense of smell, which by the way is the most frequently injured cranial nerve after concussion. Um, and they say food doesn't taste right, but nobody um, associated the two. 
those kind of things can't in and of themselves be quite significant to the individual. I've, I've had patients who just lost their sense of smell and had catastrophic reactions to that emotionally. Interesting. Let's see, we have another uh, question here. It says, uh, if a client is in a location that does not have adequate services, uh, how does one make appropriate recommendations? And uh, are we to recommend measurements uh, such as periodic neuropsychiatric evaluation? Again, I think it depends on what the issues are and how independent or not independent or disabled the individual is. So without knowing more specifics, I'll, I'll take a shot at the answer just generically. If they need services, if the patient is appropriate for transitional services and is early out from injury or never got rehab services and there's felt to be potential for functional gain and improvement, then assuming the resources are there to facilitate a referral, then, you know, we have referrals from all over the Eastern Seaboard as do other programs and programs are out there to refer to. You just need to know where they are and where the best programs are that are closest to that individual. Okay. Uh, can telemedicine be integrated anywhere within uh, these treatment plans? That's a very interesting question and whoever asked it, thank you. Um, telemedicine has not been historically a biggie in neuro rehabilitation, but there's more and more work looking at its relevancy and clinical efficacy. So my answer would be yes. Um, again, not all programs have the capacity to do telemedicine. And there's also issues with doing telemedicine across state lines. So if I had a referral that came from Connecticut and went back to Connecticut, um, there are legality issues about providing telemedicine services to someone in Connecticut because I'm not licensed in Connecticut. Same would be true for a nurse or a therapist. Um, but the answer is yes. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, there was a question here. Uh, it was just stating most of the literature that you've cited in the webinar focuses on moderate to severe uh, TBIs. Uh, and how well does uh, this literature apply to mild uh, traumatic brain injuries and, and could you expand a little bit on uh, the more milder uh, aspects of uh, TBIs? Sure, and I did mention this in the lecture that the literature hasn't really broached the role of transitional rehab long term would be inappropriate obviously, but it hasn't broached the issue of um, treatment of post-concussive patients in a transitional rehab setting. And to be honest, which is the whole presentation here is ought to be honest, I think that there's a very small group of those kind of patients who would actually be appropriate. The, the kind of patient I would consider appropriate, and I say this based on our own experience, is the kind of patient who's been through treatment, seen you know, multiple clinicians, continues three, six or more months post-injury with significant debilitating symptoms that are deemed to be referable to the concussion, whether directly or indirectly. So that could include true post-concussive symptoms, secondary psycho-emotional responses, PTSD, depression, chronic pain, etc. Um, that's the kind of patient that I think would be most appropriate for a program like this, assuming they were willing to go to a program like this. Hmm. Okay. Which not all people are. So the lawyer may say, there's a program in North Carolina in Raleigh that I'd like you to go to and the person lives in South Carolina and they go, no, I don't want to leave home and my family. So that's sometimes a obstacle to accessing treatment. I see. 
Um, there was a question about, uh, could you list a, a society or organization uh, that you'd recommend uh, as a reference to find out more about programs for TBIs, I guess, for attorneys to look into? Well, I think your best resource is probably the um, Brain Injury Association of America, and they have a listing of all programs. Okay. And they have a toll-free number, which off the top of my head I don't have in front of me, but... I can follow up with that afterwards. It's, it's great. Thank you. Um, and then uh, there's a question around uh, tests specific to anoxia, A-N-O-X-I-A. Uh-huh. Question about what about tests specific to anoxia? I, I'm not sure specifically what's being asked there, but what I would say is that typically um, PET scan well, let me start by saying this. CT and MR may show water, what are called watershed infarcts where the, uh, if there's also an ischemic component to the anoxic injury. So anoxia implies lack of oxygen. Ischemia implies lack of blood flow. So they often occur as a duality. Um, if there's ischemia and there is basically stroke or infarct, of the areas between the major vascular structures, so anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, where those come together, that's where the stroke occurs. Nice. You can also see dying back of brain matter on the CT or MRI because anoxia tends to be a global injury, although certain parts of the brain are more vulnerable to lack of oxygen, like the cerebellar Purkinje fibers, as an example. So there are areas that are predilected to be more likely injured with any significant anoxic event. Um, so you can use CT, MR, but probably more sensitive measures like functional MRI, PET scans, SPECT scans may demonstrate other abnormalities that are not picked up on standard static imaging studies. Hmm. All righty. And I would also add there are certain patterns on EEG that are also, um, how should I say, they're telling as far as prognosis, like burst suppression um, after anoxic injury. So there are certain EEG patterns associated with anoxic brain injury that tell us a lot about prognosis. All right, and then I have a couple questions about just uh, specialists to see after leaving uh, the ER uh, if the, uh, the, the patient has been diagnosed with post-concussive syndrome. Well, let me start by saying I don't encourage the use of the word syndrome because it implies a consistent set of symptoms and signs, which is not true for post-concussive impairment. It, ah. It's not consistent. So a syndromal label is, and I've talked about this for years, is not really appropriate. And I've written about it as well. Um, that point aside, um, again, if I had my druthers, my answer would be someone who specialized in brain injury medicine who understands the assessment and treatment of this patient population. There's not that many of us. There's probably 400, maybe close to 500 subspecialty board certified brain injury medicine specialists across the three disciplines I mentioned, neurology, psychiatry, and rehab. Um, that being said, the typical patient ends up going either to their family physician or a neurologist, and neither typically are adequately trained to assess those types of patients. Can they do some good? I think the answer is clearly yes, but if you're asking me who the best person is, I think I've made, hopefully made that clear in the lecture. All right, and then, uh... 
would that answer be the same if they have uh, continuing headaches, vision issues, memory issues, things yeah, like that? Yeah, I, I would consider those all potentially, and the reason I use the word potentially is there's a differential diagnosis, but those are all pretty classic post-concussive symptoms. Gotcha, okay. All right, great. Um, I think we've covered all of the questions that have come in. Uh, so I really appreciate you taking time to, uh, to, uh, to answer the questions uh, that were asked as well. So sure. Wait and see I, if anybody I, else asks anything, but it looks... Oh, go ahead. I would just add that as people have questions, I'm happy to make myself available um, to try to help with directing um, care for your clients who might be brain injured or if you have a question regarding a good reference for something, um, please let me know. That sounds great. Excellent. And just a, I had a couple questions about the slides. Uh, the slides will be posted to the website or to our website and will be downloadable. Um, the presentation has been recorded and will be available uh, as well within a couple of days. I uh, just need some time to uh, to put in the closed captioning, all of that, so it's uh, e easy to, to review. And again, I, I really appreciate the time you've taken, Dr. Zasler, to uh, just talk us through this important uh, topic. Sure, and thank you for sponsoring the session, and uh, thank you to everyone who attended.